Let me just quickly check, see if we are live. Seems your life. Okay, I hope uh, you guys can hear me. Could you please confirm once more? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the actually yeah the, the next meeting of uh, the second meeting of our PMS Modern Assistance. But yeah, essentially it's actually our first lecture. Uh, today we are gonna discuss about basics of NAND flash based SSD. So the agenda today is a uh, we we will first see SSD organization and request handling. Then we will gonna move to NAND flash organizations. And uh, we see uh, if we have enough time, we will also discuss NAND flash operations, basically how we can do read and write operations in NAND flash chips. But yeah, let's first start with SSA organization and request handling. So as we also uh, quickly discussed in the previous meeting, a modern SSD is a complicated system that consists of multiple cores, hardware controllers, DRAM and NAND flash memory packages. So in this figure, you can see an example SSD uh, PCB. That so essentially here we have uh, four NAND packages on the top of this uh, this PCB, and also in the back part we also have four more. So overall we have eight NAND packages, and each of them here is one to eight gigabytes. So gigabytes. So overall we have one terabyte SSD. And also, as we discussed, we have a small LPDDR DRAM, which usually the, the capacity of that DRAM is 0.1% uh, of uh, the total SSD size. So if our SSD capacity is one terabyte, probably we will have something like one gigabyte LPDDR DRAM. And we have a SSD controller, which is essentially a I mean, multi-core processor that also has uh, some uh, hardware flash controllers that these uh, flash control controllers they do request handling, ECC randomization, and encryption engine. So in this lecture, we are gonna uh, learn a little bit more about these components and basically, yeah, the the reason that we have them. So. Yeah, basically in SSD, we have uh, in SSD controller, it has several important uh, functionalities. One is, the first one is to implement host interface layer, which is essentially, I mean, the relationship between the SSD and the host system. It should also implement flash translation layer, FTL, which I mean, we quickly discussed that in the previous meeting. Actually, in, the, in, these, in this course, we are gonna learn more about FTL in detail, I mean, different functionalities that we need to do in FTL. But overall, uh, what we are doing in FTL is data cache management, address translation, garbage collection, where leveling and refresh. We also have flash controllers that do basically ECC and randomization. And, and in the end, I mean, these controllers, they, they are connected to NAND flash packages. We also have DRAM. So in this DRAM, we have a queue for host requests. So essentially, I mean, when you have, you, you will have uh, several requests from the host that can be from different processors or different processes. Uh, so we should have a I mean, queue for them. And also in DRAM, we have a write buffer, which is act as kind of cache for in SSD. And uh, one of the main, uh, I mean, the data structure that we have in this uh, DRAM is logical to physical mapping table. And also some metadata like PE cycles, which is essential for, uh, I mean, handling SSD uh, 
basically it's important to manage SSD functionality. So uh, we will um, see more, but I mean, this is a very quick overview. So now let's look, uh, I mean, briefly see how the write happens. And during that, we will, we will learn more about these, uh, each of these units. So basically, whenever there is a requ write request to the SSD, there should be some communication from the host and uh, to the SSD. So this is the job for the host interface layer, which uh, can be uh, implements different protocols. So this can be SOTA, which we have, uh, I mean, in conventional, I mean, HDDs, and also some SSD later. But uh, later on, people see that basically SOTA cannot provide, basically cannot utilize the high throughput that we have in SSDs compared to HDDs. So in the end, people, I mean, develop uh, better and faster and high, more high throughput protocol, which we call it NVMe uh, for SSDs. So nowadays, SSDs are kind of mostly implementing NVMe, but still we have some SSDs that they implement SATA. So a host IO request includes basically four, let's say high level uh, characteristics. One is request direction, is you going to read or write? Offset, which is the start vector address. So when you want to write or read, you should have them give the offset that from which basically vector you want to start your writing or reading. And also the size of request, which can be, I mean, the number of sectors. So are you going to read one sector, two sectors, or many more? And uh, basically, the, the, the request usually, I mean, is aligned by four kilobytes. So there is a ch something, ch okay. Yeah, so, and uh, yeah, th these requests are typically aligned by four kilobytes. Okay, yeah. So after uh, host interface layer, we will uh, move to FDL. So in the FDL, we have a basically data cache management, uh, I mean, unit which works with the right buffer in the DRAM. So as I said, in DRAM, and which is LPDDR, we have a right buffer that what we can do is that we can buffer data that we want to write. So this is actually very essential to reduce write latency. So as you will see later, uh, write latency in flash is quite slow. I mean, it's quite, I mean, it's gonna take a lot of time when you want to write to flash. So it's important in order to improve the performance, it's important that we basically write to the right buffer and then send the acknowledgement to the, to the host system. And, and then SSD can basically write to the, uh, to the flash chips later on, I mean, in, in the background. But there are also some write requests that they are, we call them kind of synchronized write, that basically SSD is not, cannot, is not allowed to, uh, to send acknowledgement to the host system before writing them to the to the NAND flash. But essentially, I mean, for mo most of the memory, I mean, SSD write requests, we can write them to the write buffer. So one of the reasons that we have write buffer, as I said, is to reduce the write latency. And another is to enable flexible IO scheduling. So that this is also an important factor. So in SSDs, essentially reads are quite uh, fast. I mean, compared to write, and the difference is quite high. If you want to read from flash or write to the flash, I mean, the difference in that these latencies are quite uh, uh, high. So when you are able to write in the right buffer, essentially you can also better, uh, I mean, handle your requests, better schedule your read, write requests, because I mean, their latencies are gonna be closer to each other and you can do that. And the uh, write buffer is also helpful for improving lifetime. So as we also observed in the, I mean, we discussed briefly in the last meeting, uh, in SSD, we have a limited number of, uh, I mean, flash, let's say, we have a limited number of PE cycles. So whenever you are writing to the SSD, you are basically aging your SSD and uh, you are consuming the endurance of your SSD. And, and in the end, uh, basically, it's going to reduce your life, uh, the SSD's lifetime. So this write buffer can essentially also help to improve lifetime if you are lucky. Why is that? So 
basically you are gonna write to a logical address and you write to the right buffer. So in the future, in the near future, if you also receive another write request to the same logical address, basically you can just update what you already have in the write buffer. And uh, I mean, that can help that instead of writing to the, uh, to the flash several times, you basically reduce the number of the, the writes and only writes the, let's say, uh, the, the most updated value. But I mean, as I said, it's not, uh, you should be lucky because usually it's not so common that you receive uh, another write to the same logical address in the near future. Why is that? Because most of the, let's say, locality is captured by the, I mean, higher cache hierarchies or data. So probably, I mean, requests, uh, addresses that you're receiving in, in SSC, they don't have much locality. And uh, I mean, for this one, I mean, probably you cannot uh, take a lot of advantages. So the write buffer size is also limited, usually tens of megabytes. And why is that? Because I mean, essentially SSDs are a non-volatile storage and they should basically ensure data integrity even under sudden power up. However, DRAM is not uh, non-volatile memory, it's a volatile. So if you reduce, if you have a sudden power off, the data in DRAM is gonna be lost. So we have some, let's say, uh, capacitors inside the SSD that basically they have enough charge just to make sure that if we have sudden power off, they can provide some electricity so that we can, I mean, write back their data inside the right buffer to the, uh, to the, to the flash chips. However, I mean, if we want to make this write buffer bigger and bigger, so essentially you're assuming that you're gonna have more dirty data. And at the same time, you will need more charges when, when you are in a sudden power off situation. So you need more capacitors and that can basically increase the cost of your SSD and also can, can be also, I mean, has a bad impact on the, uh, basically on the cost and the area of the SSD and form factor of your SSD basically. Okay, are there any questions so far? Um, Rakesh, uh, I guess you join, please uh, also have a look at uh, YouTube chat and let me know if there is any questions later. Okay, so another part is basically address transitions. So, I mean, for write, we usually, we don't uh, need to do address translation because, I mean, we, we need to write to a new uh, location, but that's important that we go to that step because we need to update the, the entry that we have in the logical to physical mapping table. So as we also, again, discussed briefly in the previous meeting, we cannot, uh, we have out of place right or update. So whenever you have update on the same logical address, you cannot basically write update the same physical location that you have. I mean, you can, but then that comes at a very uh, high cost, performance cost, because you need to copy what you already have in that block, not, not even that page. You need to copy all the data that you have in that block to the to the DRAM, let's say to the temporary storage. And then you can basically erase the whole block and, uh, and update the, that page that you want to change and then write back the whole data again, the whole block again. So you can imagine how inefficient is that if you want to do in-place update. By the way, I mean, there are also some papers that there are uh, they are trying to do in-place updates with some tricks. We will uh, see them actually later on in this course. Uh, they are not, let's say, completely, I mean, general enough so that we can use them for all cases, but it's good to see how people think critically so that, I mean, how we can enable in-place updates with, I mean, with, with good performance, not uh, the performance that I was mentioning before. But I mean, overall, the understanding is that in SSCs, you can, it's not efficient to do in-place update and you need to do out-of-place update. So whenever you receive an update, you're gonna 
basically find a candidate, which is a, another a free page in another block. Or it can be also in the same block, but there should be another free page. And you will be right. Uh, you will be you will write to that uh, basically uh, free page. And you need to update uh, your metadata in the logical to physical mapping. So previously, for example, uh, your logical address one was mapped to, let's say, uh, yeah, physical uh, address five. But now this logical address is going to move uh, map to physical address seven, for example. So you need to update that mapping table, basically. And the mapping granularity is, uh, I mean, four kilobyte. We will see later also that, I mean, uh, to reduce the cost of this mapping table, we have uh, some people, I mean, uh, propose to have this per 16 kilobyte. But I mean, uh, usually modern SSDs, they are uh, keeping the mapping granularity in four kilobyte, which that's the reason that I was saying that basically this DRAM uh, size is usually 0.1% of the SSD capacity. So when your mapping guarantee is four kilobytes, it means that you are going to store something like four bytes per four kilobytes uh, page, right? Or for four kilobyte uh, data. So, and you can see the, this, this, I mean, the ratio here, right? So it's four bytes to four kilobytes, which is 0.1% of the SSD capacity. And you can see that this is the kind of estimation because I mean the most uh, yeah the, the, the most uh, the part of this DRAM is allocated to to this mapping table and write buffer has request queue and metadata they are not the they say the dominant uh, space that we have in DRAM uh, meta DRAM uh, storage. And also uh, another part of this FTL is to do GC. Uh, garbage collection. So, because you are uh, always, you're gonna, when, whenever you want to update, you're gonna to write to a free page. At some point, basically we run out of free pages and you need to reclaim free pages. And how you do that, basically you need to select a victim block. The block that we have the highest, no, probably, I mean, there should be also different ways, but one way is to consider a block that has the highest number of invalid pages. And what is invalid page? The page that has absolute value. So the page that has the data for the address, and then for that address, you update the data. So you, you just, you write that data to another free page and you make the previous physical address as invalid page. So basically, which means that the data there, not important for me. You can easily erase that because I have the the, the most up to date value of that address in another free page. So you will uh, select a block with the highest number of uh, invalid pages, and then you need to copy all valid pages in that block because there can be some valid pages also in that block, and then you can erase the victim block, right? So this this is the the, the operation of garbage collection. We will see. I mean, we will have a, a full lecture in garbage collection and what are the performance issues of GC and how we can, I mean, improve that. But uh, I hope you have an idea about uh, the GC operation. And GC is quite uh, costly in SSD. And it's one of the main performance bottleneck that we have in SSD's GC operations. Another operation is ver leveling, which is important to evenly distribute P cycles across NAT flash block. You don't want to have some, I mean, uh, flash blocks that they are hot. Basically you update them a lot. You update and erase them a lot. And some flash blocks that they are cold. So essentially for where leveling, uh, you need to balance the hotness of these uh, flash blocks. And in, basically if, yeah, if, if, the, if there is a flash block which is hot, you're gonna uh, not select that for a while and try to select more cold uh, flash blocks in order to distribute evenly the PE cycles. And another part of this FTL is doing a ref I mean, data refresh. So SSDs are, uh, let's say, non-volatile memory and the retention time for your data 
is a lot. I mean, you can consider as if you write your data in SSC, probably it's going to uh, store your data with no issue for one year, two years, or sometimes more. But at some point, you need to refresh your data. And we will see why we need to do that. But yeah, basically, this is the, the part of FTA to understand that which flash blocks they need refreshing and to do the refresh. FTL also has other tasks to do, but I mean, these are just high, some examples. Any questions here for FTA? Okay. So after that, we need to go to the flash controller and flash controller essentially do randomization. Randomization is really important for SSDs. What we do is basically we randomize the data that you want to run. So there is there should be some key that we scramble our data with that key. And the reason we are doing that is to ensure that the worst case pattern, data pattern is not going to happen in the, in the flash sheet. Because there are some worst case patterns of your data that can basically increase the likelihood of your um, error in, in flash sheets. So in order to basically avoid that, you are going to, you are scrambling your data with a key which is randomization phase and your data in the flashes. And you can understand that this randomization is also backward uh, compatible. I mean, so with that key, you, are, you will uh, randomize and later on, you will also de-randomize your data with that key also. So you can have the original data um, in SSD. Another uh, operation of flash controller is, is to do ECC which is basically we have ACC that can detect and correct errors. I mean, there can be different uh, version of ECC with different uh, I mean, strengths, but one of them is can be, I mean, can detect or correct errors for 72 bits per one kilobyte error correction capability. But yeah, I mean, this is something that can be changed in different uh, ECC implementations. And in SEC, we need to store additional parity information together with raw data. So flash controller is, uh, is, yeah, needs to calculate those parities and align with, I mean, uh, basically concat those parities with your raw data and then store the whole data inside the flash. And then we have some controller in the flash controller, basically that those controller is, uh, what they are doing is, uh, uh, issuing NAND flash comments. So NAND flash packages, they, they need some analog, let's say, uh, interface, and this controller is doing that. Um, so to communicate and handshake with the NAND flash package in order to, I mean, let NAND flash package know that, oh, you're going to receive a new data to write. And this is the address, for example. And using those uh, commands, NAND flash package is, gonna, is uh, I mean, will, uh, uh, will be ready so that, I mean, uh, write your data, store your data, or, I mean, for read, it's going to respond to your uh, address. Okay. Now let's see quickly uh, what we are doing when we have a read. So after a uh, host interface layer that you receive your read address, you need to first uh, check the right buffer because if you're lucky, the, the read address, the address that you want to read can be fine, can be found in the, in the right buffer. So this is what you can do with, uh, with read. I mean, again, you need to be lucky, but I mean, uh, there are also some cases that you can actually find your data in data cache in the right buffer. So if you can, basically, if you find that, you, the host read, uh, you will uh, respond quickly to the host system. And Basically, this is also important to note that a host read request can be involved with several pages. So it's not only the case that you will, I mean, you want to read one page. So your request can be several pages. And then uh, such a request can be written only after all the requests that data is read. So if you want to read, for example, 16 pages, the host uh, inter interface layer will, will wait until you have, you prepare all these 16 pages and then we respond to the whole system. Okay. 
So after, uh, so if you are not lucky and you couldn't find your data, you need to do the address translation. So you know, you know the uh, logical address of your read, but you don't know where is mapped that logical address. So you check this the uh, physical, uh, yeah, physical page to uh, physical to logical uh, mapping table to understand that. Sorry, logical to physical page uh, mapping table to understand where is the data actually stored. And then uh, you will find the physical address so that you can issue your command, read command to that uh, math flash. And you will access uh, basically the data. I mean, you will read the data from the flash sheet. But after you read the data, you need to do basically uh, ECC decoding and de randomize the data. So it is important to note that your ECC decoding can show that you are basically you have some errors that you cannot correct them. So you need to retry the reading of the page with, with adjusting uh, voltage, reference voltage that we will see that, uh, hopefully today or later uh, in the next lecture. But basically when you want to read the data in flash, you need to provide a reference voltage. And that's uh, sometimes the reason that you, uh, your ECC is fake is, is that your reference voltage is not <clears throat> good enough. So you need to basically adjust it and re uh, retry the read. And sometimes, I mean, uh, so people observe that if you use a simple ECCs, I mean, this ECC uh, failing can, failure can happen very common. So nowadays they also using uh, more sophisticated ECC technique. Uh, that I mean, probably we are not gonna cover that, but if you are interested, you can let me know and we will try to cover ECC techniques as well. Okay. Any questions? Rakesh, are there any questions on uh, YouTube chat? Okay. Okay, the next uh, topic in today's agenda is uh, NAND flash organization. So overall now you know that uh, how we, I mean, uh, the, the, the high level organization of the SSD, the high level components, and you know the functionality of each of these components and how we handle requests, the SSD, I mean, at a very high level picture. But now we want to see how we organize NAND flash uh, chip. So a NAND flash chip, I mean, it consists of many, uh, NAND flash cells, and each uh, flash cell is basically is a transistor. So you know that uh, in transistor we have a source and drain, and we have a gate, and each transistor has a threshold voltage, and depending on the voltage that you are uh, applying between gate and source, uh, if the if that voltage is higher than threshold voltage, essentially you you will uh, turn on uh, your transistor and your transistor can basically flow uh, current from drain to source. And if you are, um, if uh, the gate source voltage is less than threshold voltage, I mean, your transistor is off. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it will act as an open switch basically. So the difference between a uh, flag cell and normal transistor is that we have a special material in the in flash cells that place between the gate and the substrate, which we call it floating gate in 2D NAND flash cells or charge trap in 3D NAND flash cells. I mean, uh, the idea of floating gate and charge trap overall the same, but for simplicity, we only cover floating gate. As I said, again, also, if you are interested to know more on any of these things, you can, uh, let me know later and I will try to cover. So basically the operation of this floating gate is that it can hold electrons in a normal assignment. So whenever you want to program your flash cell, you need to apply a high voltage, high enough voltage here, for example, 20 volts. That high voltage uh, uh, causes that we tunnel, make some tunneling and we, uh, move electrons from substrate to the floating gate. 
And since this, I mean, in this floating gate, these electrons will be trapped. And essentially, since you have some uh, negative charge in your, uh, <clears throat> in your gate, that results in higher voltage threshold. So when you program a flash cell, the threshold voltage of that flash cell is, will be higher. So that can show you basically by understanding the difference between these threshold voltage, you will understand that if this flash cell is programmed or not, or is already erased. So whenever you want to check that, you will apply reference voltage as, as we also see in the uh, previous uh, slides that we have a reference voltage. So that reference voltage is something between a normal or normal threshold voltage and the high threshold voltage. So by applying that VREF, if, uh, if basically if your flash cell acts as a resistance, which means that it's on, which means this reference voltage is higher than threshold voltage. And that threshold voltage, then there should be basically the, the normal threshold voltage because uh, the high, uh, because the reference voltage is not high enough to uh, basically to turn on the transistor, which is programmed. And if it is not programmed with that reference voltage, you will understand that the threshold voltage is high. So you already program your flash set. And then you need to encode these two states. So we encode uh, the, the, the resistance uh, phase as one, which is the erase one. So whenever your flash set is erased, you will consider it as one. And whenever you program your uh, flash set, you will consider it as zero. Is it clear so far? OK. So yeah. So when you want to erase, basically uh, you need to apply a negative voltage, again, high voltage, like negative 20 volts, minus 20 volt to the gate. And that can basically move those trapped electrons to the substrate again. <clears throat> and the threshold voltage of your transistor will be moved to the normal uh, phase. So yeah, this is the high level uh, for the, how we basically program and erase in that flash set. So uh, basically, one of the characteristics of flash cell is that we have multi leveling. So a flash cell can store multiple bits. We will see now. So when you program, basically you, in, uh, you move electrons and you trap them in, in the charge trap. So, and when you erase, you basically you eject electrons to the uh, substrate. So you can actually encode uh, with some with more accuracy the amount of electrons that you are trapped in the that you that they are trapped in the in the in the charge stack. So with that you can understand that basically what what is the data store. So if you have the accuracy and basically uh, categorize the whole I mean the threshold voltage in four levels you can essentially store two bits in your in each flash cell. But that can be also provide more, let's say, a high uh, less reliability. So it will, it's good for capacity, but it is less reliable. And you can actually uh, do that more. I mean, you can you can have eight levels, which can store three bits, or you can have 16 levels, which can store four bits. And usually, I mean, nowadays SSDs that they are cost optimized or optimized for capacity, they are actually TLT, which is triple uh, triple level, or let's say, I mean, they, they can store three bits or QLC that they can store four bits. But there are also some SSDs that they are optimized for performance and they uh, store only, I mean, uh, one bit, zero or one. Okay. So another characteristic is retention loss. So a cell leaks electrons over time. So the electron that we trap here, uh, they're gonna stay for a long time if you don't do anything. But after a moment, I mean, uh, they will, uh, some electrons, electrons there will 
move to the substrate and essentially reduce the threshold voltage. So after some time, you will see that uh, basically after one year, for example, you will see that the threshold voltage is reducing, but it still is okay because you don't basically uh, pass the margin, but can happen that after another year, basically you have more retention loss and essentially you will read something wrong. So the threshold voltage that you have there, uh, you were supposed to read one zero, for example, but now you're reading zero zero, which is a retention error. And another is uh, point is limited lifetime. So a cell wears out after P the number of P cycling. So that can actually happen your, your retention error. So in one year, if the normal P cycles of your uh, flash is 1K, for example, the number of P cycles is, I mean, overall 1K, you won't have a lot of retention loss. But if you have, if you are basically right program to a flash still that the P cycles of that is 10K, so after one year, you will uh, lose more, uh, let's say, you will have more retention loss. And essentially, you will have retention error more likely. So in order to make sure that your SSD worked uh, reliably, you need to make sure that uh, basically at some point you refresh your data. And that refreshing can uh, is related to the number of PE cycles. If your SSD is young, or essentially if that block that uh, keep your data is young enough, probably you can wait more before refreshing. But if that block is aged, and has a lot of, I mean, P cycles, you need to refresh that more frequently. Okay, is everything clear? Cool. So, so multiple flash cells can be 128, that they are serially connected, with the beat line, we call them a NAND, uh, to, the, to a beat line, we call them a NAND string. So here you can see that we have an example NAND string that there are uh, several flash cells that they are connected to each other. And uh, so whenever you want to have it uh, target one cell, you need to apply VPASS to other NAND flash cells. And VPASS is high enough to make sure that that flash cell is gonna act as a register no matter if you already programmed that or is erased. So it should be high enough, which means that it should be high enough, it should be greater than the highest threshold voltage that you can have after program. But for that target cell, you will apply a reference voltage basically. And uh, you will read or write or something. I mean, we will see more uh, how we do read and write, but this is the idea that how we basically target one cell in an industry. The second, uh, the next level of granularity is the page and block. So a large number of uh, cells that they operate concurrently in a row, we call them a page or a word line. So you can see that here, uh, I mean, this row, this word line is a, is a page of, can be for example, 16 kilobyte plus some alpha, that alpha can be, I mean, for ECC or some other metadata that we need to keep. But yeah, this, this word line is, uh, I mean, can it store one page or several pages. And uh, basically a group of these pages, they can arrange a block. So essentially a block is a number of word line times number of beats per cell. And then it has this number of pages, right? So each block has the number of word, the number of word line uh, times number of bits per set pages. So as we as we discussed, each uh, NAND flash set can store multiple bits. So for example, if you if you are storing two bits, essentially you can store two pages in your word line. So that's the reason we are saying that. I mean. Uh, it's, it's quite common to say that, yeah, in NAND flash chip, in one word line, we are storing two pages or three pages or four pages, depending on the, the how many bits you are storing in one flash set. So that's the definition of page and block. 
So the thing is that uh, program and arrays is unidirectional. So when you program a cell, you essentially you're increasing the cell's voltage threshold. And whenever you want to erase a cell, you need to decrease the cell voltage threshold. And that is uh, basically program page cannot change zero cells to one cell. That's because we need arrays before write property. And uh, so in NAND flash shifts, the array unit is block. The read and program unit is page, but erase unit is block in, in order to increase the erase bandwidth. So that uh, makes in place write on a page very inefficient. And that's the, one of the reasons that we need out of place write. And then later on, we need to do GC. Okay, so after uh, NAND is, so, so far we see NAND flash cell, and then we see a number of NAND flash cells that they are connected serially because the NAND is stream. And then uh, a group of NAND flash cells that they are working concurrently in a row, we call them uh, a page. And a number of pages that they are, uh, I mean, using the same, let's say, uh, I mean, NAND strings, we call them block. But then another level is planes. So a large number of blocks that they shape uh, bit lines, they form a plane. So here, each of these uh, rectangles, they are a NAND string. And you can see that several different NAND strings, they are connected to the same bit line, right? So we call uh, the whole, I mean, the whole this uh, uh, structure as a one plane. So one thing is that you have, you should have this possibility to show that which NAND string is now connected to the bit line. Because currently, I mean, you don't have control. I mean, all of them can be connected. Because of that, to the NAND string, we also add a two other transistors, which we call them a string select line or ground and also ground select line, that uh, these two transistors can help you to have some control on which NAND string is now uh, should be connected to the bit line. So yeah, that's the definition of the plane. And then, uh, so after plane, you have die. So a die contains uh, multiple planes, could be two to four plane or something else. So the thing is that, I mean, in this example, in a 21 nanometer 2D NAND flash die, we have four planes, and we have page buffer and peripheral circuits. So there are some row and column decoders, and that's really important that planes share decoders, which can show that basically, essentially, I mean, yes, the planes can work in parallel, but not completely. Whenever your address is addressed to different planes are quite, I mean, uh, nicely aligned to the same offset, you can basically use this property and uh, you have plane level parallelism. So several planes in the die, they can work in parallel, which is very good for performance. But uh, it's not the case uh, always because uh, sometimes your address to the different planes are not aligned. They are not the same offset and you cannot work in parallel. So this is one of the auto optimization goals that you can have in SSD. And FPL is in charge actually to make sure that you are maximized plane level parallel. And then basically after planes and dice, we have, uh, I mean, several, one or two or several dice can, uh, can, yeah, uh, can be placed together as a chip, as a NAND flash chip or NAND flash package. And these NAND flash packages you will see on the, on the PCB. So as a very quick overview, we have NAND flash cell. A number of NAND flash cells is connected serially, they are NAND string. A group of NAND flash cells that they work in parallel in a row, we call them page. A number of page makes a block. A number of blocks that they are shared the same bit lines, we call them plane. And a number of plane, which can be, I mean, two, four, something like that. Planes, uh, they uh, basically, they they create die, and then we can have one, two, or a number of dies in a chip, in a NAND flash chip. And dies can work completely independently. So if you have, uh, you can have basically two requests to different dies 
in an end flash chip, and all of them can work completely independently. At least when they are when they are inside an end flash, you will have some shared uh, infrastructure that we will see later. I mean interconnection, but when they when these requests are uh, operating inside an end flash chip, they can work in parallel. Okay, any questions? So yeah, I don't think we have time to cover NAND flash operations. I would uh, suggest that we keep this part for the next uh, for the next uh, lecture next week. That we will cover how we do I mean, NAND flash read write operations and sensing circuitry in NAND flash. So, are there any questions from the Zoom audience and also people from YouTube? Okay, so if there is no more question, I guess we can uh, wrap up. I mean, the, the first part of today's uh, meeting. Uh, thanks everyone and thanks uh, people that you are joining over YouTube and uh, this, we will cover uh, more in this direction next week. So I'm gonna stop live streaming now.